As we all know, the Philadelphia Eagles have traded Hassan Reddick. How does that impact their plans for the 2024 NFL Draft? A post-Reddick trade mock draft Monday. It's coming your way. You are Locked On Eagles, your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome on in, Eagles fans. I'm Louis DiBiase, co-host of the Lockdown Eagles podcast. Eagles analyst also over at Bleacher Report. He's Gino Camilleri, our scouting director, my co-host, and another analyst also over at Bleacher Report. On today's edition of the Lockdown Eagles podcast, it's Mock Draft Monday, right after the Hassan Reddick trade. How does this change Howie Roseman's plans on day one, day two, and day three? We'll get into that. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen. Each and every day in today's show is sponsored by FanDuel. Make every moment more more right now new customers get $200 back in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet that's 200 bucks back if your bet wins visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started so Gino we will get into our mock draft but there was actually some news that hit right before we started recording our episode safety Reed Blankenship did get a one-year contract extension from the Eagles he can get up to 3.9 million dollars over the next two years he can earn another 1.3 in playing time incentives and Pro Bowl escalators, which this actually came just a few hours after he got the second highest playtime incentive from last year, almost a million dollars, a little over, I should say, 900 k So a nice contract for an undrafted free agent just a few years ago. It's a great story and a pretty productive role player, I would say, for this team. He's going to be a full-time starter, I think, to start 2024, and we'll see where the future goes. But man, I mean, from undrafted to this is a big play. It's a big day for Reed Blankenship, man. Yeah, it's a cool story. As Mr. Slay would say, he's not a milk check. And (laughs) speaking of check, he got a big one today. And as you said, he got the second highest allotment of quote-unquote performance-based incentives. A lot of it's based on playing time, how many snaps. So it's not truly based all on performance. But shout out to him. And then he goes and he gets a contract extension, which is going to keep him here through 2025. And the first thing I thought, Lou, is... For the first time in a couple of years, they have some continuity at this safety room. I say the, at since least the first time. Next year. I don't know, going back to like 2018, 2019, when you have Malcolm Jenkins and Rodney McLeod. Yeah, this is the first time in I think four years you really know who at least multiple safeties are going to be on this team. And now with Vic Fangio coming in, I think you were going to see all three of these guys on the field for a majority of the season. And I saw you were talking about it on Twitter today that he could be the quote unquote third safety. I really don't think it's going to be a a true one, two or three. I think all these guys are going to have roles and they're going to have to go and play him and especially read right away. Was he not starting next to Chauncey Gardner Johnson in the Super Bowl just over a calendar year ago? And now he's back again. As the number two, he's going to drop back into the lineup where he truly belongs. It's like that role player safety who can do it all. He can cover half of the field for you. He's arguably your best tackler in the defensive secondary. Is he the best coverage guy in the world? No, but did he make some huge plays for you last year? Talk about that Washington game, Lou. Guy comes down on his arm, makes a play laying out for the ball, and he keeps he pushes the guy out of bounds and you win the game because of Reed Blankenship and he comes up with multiple big interceptions for you last year and you're not breaking the bank for a guy who could potentially oh, be yeah. a starter for you or is a starter for you and an yeah. bona fide starter for you that was a UDFA talk about scouting That's scouting through and through. Shout out Middle Tennessee, man. Big ups to them. Yeah, when you look at the investment they made, an undrafted rookie that now they're barely, even with this contract, paying much at all, Gino, compared to the production he's putting on the field, that's a huge return on your investment, right? I mean, you're making a huge profit off of Reed Blankenship for sure. This is a bargain player to have on your roster. So I think he's a great role player. And yeah, I want a three safety package to be a base for this defense. I want them to use a lot of defensive backs. So when I tweeted out that I think Blankenship in an ideal world is your third safety, I just more meant, again, the coverage ability. I like the abilities more of Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and Sidney Brown's potential Mm -hmm. long-term that, to me, those are your top two guys from a talent perspective perspective and maybe a snap count perspective, but Reed Blankenship to me should be a staple of this defense long term. As you mentioned, I mean, he's one of your best tacklers, if not the best in the secondary. He's Mm -hmm. somebody that 
the first half of the year, even in coverage, was really solid. I just think compared to the other two, he has more of a limited skill set. But, I mean, again, for the contract and the investment, I mean, yeah, absolutely keep this guy on the defense. I know we always use the Golden State Warrior analogy, right? But let's use a Sixers analogy. He's not the Joel Embiid of that defense, right? He's not going to be the CGJ, the heartbeat of it. But could he be a Tyrese Maxey, somebody who could step up in big games? Yeah, he's not a Nicholas Morrow where he was only out there because of injuries and because the defense wasn't talented. I think he totally belongs. Yeah, I just don't think he's, again, a top-tier safety in the league that's your number one guy. Or In an ideal world, he's like a 2A, 2B. The, for the more common knowledge, for those who aren't Eagles and Sixers fans, he is the Clay Thompson, right? Not somebody who's going to be the franchise type of guy at that position, yep. but somebody who can go and be. And that's a what they really asked him to be last year, Gino. Yeah, they asked him last year to replace Chauncey Garner Johnson, and that, that was what I wasn't happy with. But this year, I, I love the role because now CGJ is back. So Blankenship yep. is back where he belongs. And he slots into the role which he should belong, which yep. is that not truly a number one. He isn't going to have to cover the Travis Kelsey's of the world when it exactly. comes down to it, right? That's going to be Chauncey Gardner Johnson's job from now on. He can play his role. And what is his role going to be in a Fanjo world? I think he's going to be like your primary let's go old school, strong safety type of guy Mm -hmm. who is on the strong side of formations that he is going to be a primary force player for you. And he is going to be the guy that when the defensive line spills things out to the sideline, he can track from the train tracks or the hash to come downhill, fill the alley for you. And he's really, really good at that, Lou. He is such a sure handed tackler for you. He kind of reminds me of TJ Edwards in a way. Somebody tweeted out that they did the exact sort of formula where you avoid the RFA year by extending him for the year, which they did with TJ Edwards. That's kind of who he is, man. You, you lucked into a solid starter in the national football league via undrafted free agency. And in a year where Sidney Brown is going to be out for who knows how long right, towards ACL injury, in January. So they're going to need blanket chip for at least the first half of the year to be a full time. We won't guy. have questions going into August about who is going to be starting at the other safety position. That's, like that's we did for the first year. time in a long time, Gino. Yeah. So that's a, a really nice change of pace. And yeah, as you mentioned earlier, this is the first time they it feels like you're on the right track for long term stability of this position since you had Malcolm Jenkins and Ronnie McLeod for mm-hmm. four seasons in a row. So that's a great sign blanket chip a really awesome story and it's a bargain for the talent that you're getting on the field so blanket chip gets a one-year extension keeping him an eagle through 2025 coming up next right here on the lockdown eagles podcast it's mock draft monday we had a huge trade on friday hassan riddick shipped over to the new york jets does that mean maybe more of a priority on the edge we'll find out coming up next right here on lockdown eagles Mock Draft Monday here at LOE. It only means one thing, that this episode is brought to you by our fan, our friends over at FanDuel. Excuse me. The sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Quite literally, we're in the sports equinox right now. Basketball's back. You got football back with the UFL. You got big-time hockey going on as they rush towards the playoffs. And same with the NBA. You got Final Fours, Elite Eights. This is the time to get in on the action. And if you're a new customer to FanDuel, you're going to go there and you're going to create a new account by going to FanDuel.com slash lockdown. And what you're going to do is you're going to deposit $5 responsibly. And when you hit on that $5 bet, by using that promo code lockdown, you're going to get 40 times your money back. 40 times your money, $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Like I said, you get bet on the tourneys, both men and women. You got the sports equinox with all sports going on right now. Go to FanDuel.com where you can buy and all that and more. FanDuel, the official sports book of LOE, the Lockdown Podcast Network, and all of America. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. Guys, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV? You have to turn down the volume with all that shouting. Make the switch to Lockdown. On sports today. It's a free 24 7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all that screaming. Locked on sports today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24 7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels. That part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Mock Draft Monday, we continue to roll on. It's 
April 1st, which is crazy. We are only a few weeks away from the NFL draft. So Gino and I, were definitely going to rev up the mock drafts. We might even have some weeks where we have multiple mock draft shows for YouTube and our audio listeners as well on all podcast platforms. But Gino, this one's interesting because this was, again, another week where we felt like things were going to start dying down and we could you know, start to continue to go over other crazy scenarios that could happen. But then the Hassan Riddick trade came to be on Friday. So we got to look at a post Reddick world. What does that change up here? One thing we do have to correct, Lou, people were on us in the comments. The Hassan Reddick condition on the trade, it has to be 67.5% snaps played and 10 sacks. So that is two things that they have to hit in order for it to be a second. But when it comes down to the personnel department, I asked this question to you on Friday show when we first mentioned it. Was this something that they already had in the plans that they, they knew they were preparing for a post Hassan Reddick world and that they were evaluating edge just as much as they were as a potential future right tackle as just as much as they were as a potential cornerback number one? Or, and I'm assuming it's going to be the first option because Howie Roseman is somebody who will turn over every stone. Did they just say, okay, it's time to go and start evaluating this edge talent? I will say that they've probably been looking at this group for a while. It probably gave them confidence at yeah. how potentially deep this group is that they could go and find help on top of what they already have in a very young group now. When mm -hmm. Brandon Graham is gone after this year, Lou, I mean – that average is going to drop off of a cliff. They were very young at this position and are probably going to get younger in a couple of weeks from now. Yeah, and you know, I think the Riddick trade doesn't suddenly mean they have to go edge at 22 and it's obvious that this is the position that they're going to take because, as you mentioned, they still have a bunch of young players. Like Josh Sweat, he's on a one-year deal, but if he has a breakout, I don't want to say breakout season, but like as the guy this year, he has a double-digit sack season, he'll probably get an extension. Bryce Huff is young, so is Nolan Smith. Like You don't need an edge, but at the same time, Josh Sweat is only on a one-year deal. Nolan Smith has not emerged yet. Bryce Huff has not shown he's a full-time player. He's shown he's an elite pass rusher, but not an every down guy. And Brandon mm -hmm. Graham's going to be gone after this year. So, you know, either way, I think you could, you could justify that they really need an edge or also that they don't need to take one at all. 22 is really starting to set up for truly the best player available scenario. In my opinion, Lou, I know you said it that you hate Pure the idea corner, of it. but yeah. Yeah, if you remove corner, and I think those guys are probably going to be off the board. I mean, the, the big three are Nate Wiggins, Kenyon Mitchell, and, and Terry and Arnold, and I think all of them are going to be gone. So do you sit there and one of those tackles falls to you, or do you draft potentially the best edge in the class that could fall to you? I don't know if you like Liatu Latu or Jared Verse more or what your cup of tea is, but that's a decision the Eagles are going to have to find. Do they want they tr a true replacement to Brandon Graham in that hand in the dirt, front side, strong side, run defending edge rusher? Or do they want somebody who's going to be a compliment to what Nolan Smith and Bryce Huff can do? After the top of the draft here, it is really kind of pick your flavor at this position. Yeah. But when it boils down to it, could you end up with a really good player for multiple good seasons by drafting an edge on day one? In my opinion, yeah, there's five guys that you could potentially get out there and put in rotation right away. I think so, too, and the draft at the top is going to be very offense-heavy. Let's start this mock draft off, though, taking a look at the board. There was a run a little bit on some top edge rushers early. Dallas Turner from Alabama went at eight overall here to the Falcons. Uh, the Bears right after took Latu from UCLA at 9. Uh, Jared Verse, who I really like from Florida State, he went at 16. So three of the top edge rushers did go um, inside that top 20 there. So, Gino, I had the pleasure of taking the first pick last week, went with Edrin Cooper after trading down with the Chiefs to pick 32. Tried to spice it up, go linebacker day one. You've got 22 now. So let's pull up the edge board here. And, of course, the yeah, let's see the what Yeah, let's see what we got so far. It is Chop Robinson. It is... Darius Robinson, Chris Braswell's right behind them, Adiza Isaac, Braylon Trice, if that's your cup of tea, out of Washington. I know that Chop Robinson is the Philly pick. It makes so much sense. But Darius Robinson, yeah, if agree. there was ever an exact clone of Josh Sweat where you could take this guy who 
is he a true edge player? Is he a true interior player? He's just really long and really athletic and can play football really, mm-hmm. really well. I like that pick. Is 22 maybe a little bit rich for your blood? I don't know, but having somebody that could play multiple positions, versatility, that fits height, weight, speed standards as an athlete and played big-time football in the SEC – that pick makes so much sense, and you want to see the production base and the traits base. That's the guy. Chop, you don't know what he can be. Darius Robinson, I really like what he already is. I think you might get a higher ceiling with a guy like Chop. He could be a, yeah. a, an all-world edge rusher for all you know, but at the same time, he could be what he is now and maybe be in a rotation and get you three sacks a year or – Darius Robinson could really be the freak of nature, which he is, and and go out there and dominate at the line of a scrimmage at the point of attack and be the guy who takes over for Josh Sweat in a year. No, I, I actually agree. And I, I like the logic of, yeah, Chop Robinson, like I love his explosiveness off the edge. That is something that he again, his ceiling is there. He's got all the traits, but you already kind of have a couple fastballs in Nolan Smith in Bryce mm-hmm. Huff. And like you said, Josh Sweat's only on a one year deal. Maybe instead of having the more versatile athletic guy in the outside, like a lot of times we talk about can a player be, you know, an outside linebacker and also rush the passer. What about the guy that we used to talk about all the time, like a Charles Amenehu, more of the edge rusher defensive tackle hybrid? Mm-hmm. That is more Darius Robinson, and that can help too a defensive tackle group that Right now, it's up in the air what all these young guys are going to be. So Darius Robinson can also rush the passer from the inside, maybe on third downs. And I think that's, I don't know. I don't think it's a reach at 22. Robinson also was maybe the best player, regardless of position at the senior bowl. Like, I don't know, Gino. I don't think that's a, if you believe in a pass rusher on day one, like, I don't think it's ever really a reach unless it's like Marcus Smith. Yeah, unless it quite literally is Marcus. Like where it's three rounds higher, right? I mean, that is disaster scenario. But no, like I said on the intro, it is if you don't get one of the top two guys that might fit every type of role, it is. is, Pick a style. Yeah, it's every board is going to be different, right? Like Philadelphia's board is going to be completely different than potentially what Dallas's board is going to look like, which is going to be different from what the Giants board and so on and so forth. So just like with tackle, where it might be. One team might have Fautanu up at the top. One team might have Fuaga up at the top and Joe all. And it's, it's going to vary on what you need. And especially the Philadelphia Eagles in a Vic Fangio world where they don't truly play four guys hand in the dirt. It's two guys are going to be hand in the dirt and the rest are going to be rushing the passer more than likely. For sure. So, Gino, I'm on the clock here at pick 50, and there's been a guy that, so a good friend of the show that we've had on in the past, Andrew DiCecco, really respect his draft opinion. He was talking about this prospect, and uh, I have a great friend that went to Wake Forest as well, so I started to do some work on this kid over the last few months, and Kalen Carson is a corner that once you go, I think after Ennis Rakestraw, there is a drop-off at corner talent on day two when it comes to like the boundary. I think after that, it gets like, you look at Max Melton's on the board here from Rutgers. You look at... uh, also love they had a lot of interest i agree and he's maybe the most athletic corner in this class and the eagles could use slot help for sure i don't know if i think it's might a little be it might excuse me be a little too rich here at 50 but you look at like andrew phillips from kentucky it gets very slot dependent Kalen carson is one of those last guys that has the athleticism has the length can play both man and zone good ball skills doesn't have like one elite trait but everything he just does really well and i think he's just a very smooth just guy in the short area i think Kalen carson's a player we've never taken in a mock draft before and i think at 50 like i don't think it's a reach so I'm going to go with Kalen Carson, the corner from Wake Forest. Is this maybe a need pick over BPA? Sure, but people know my stance on that philosophy. I think Kalen Carson would be worth the pick here. And and this is another position, Lou. Like Once you get past the top guys, like what do you need? Do you need a Max Melton to come in and potentially replace Avante Maddox? And this Kalen Carson pick, dude, I love what Wake Forest did in their defensive secondary last year. I've been watching a lot of Malik Mustafa. I am in love with him. Good safety prospect, too. Alan Carson, too, man. They they do a lot of things in that secondary. You got to be physical. You got to be able to play and, and press at the point of attack. And I like that pick, man. And you could have made the argument, Max Melton, do you make the athlete pick and how close he is sure. to Philadelphia going to Rutgers and how much interest they showed? You could absolutely make that argument. And what I'm going to do, Lou, 
I'm not going to pull an April Fool's. I'm going to go and do something that this team hasn't done in so long, in quite literally two decades. I'm going to go back-to-back picks here. I am going to draft Max Mountain. They're going to I add love it. another the double cornerback dip. to that room. They're going to say, you know what? No more playing around. We're going to double dip at this position. We're going to go defensive heavy off the top. This is truly what we need. And, folks, if this is April Fool's Day. I don't play into any of those jokes. If this is how the Eagles board looked, that they went edge, cornerback, cornerback, you're not only getting two positions of need, you're also getting three guys in the top 53 to add to a unit, which – severely dropped off a cliff last year. They need help in the worst way. Could they go really defensive heavy like that Carolina Panthers draft under the first year of Matt, mm-hmm. a year of Matt Rule? That could be the case, Lou. They need so much help there. And then you've got some staples of young corners, right? Because Bradbury and Slay, like this might be the last year for those two. It might not even be this year that James Bradbury gets still in Philadelphia. So you've got Keely Ringo, you got Isaiah Rogers coming off that suspension. Then you throw in Kalen Carson and Max Melton. Like, Gino, of those four, you have a really good chance of finding two or three studs. And who's to say they can't do it? They did it 20 years ago. You look at that draft when Bobby Taylor is as old as he is, and they finally go out and invest in multiple guys in that defensive secondary. And you think of the Lito Shepherds who come into the league and the Sheldon Browns. Like, even though you have good players on your roster, you have to look ahead. And who's to say that they don't double dip at this position, which they have done multiple times. They do it at wide receiver and they do it at cornerback. I love that we finally did this. And I think the board fell in a way that we could go and approach it like that. And again, it's it makes sense. It's not like you drafted two boundary corners. I mean, one's more of a slot guy. Like yep. Max Melton fits perfectly as that Avante Maddox replacement. And Kalen Carson's more of an outside guy. We did this a few years ago in 2020 when the Eagles badly needed receiver help. We did a lot of double dips at receiver. Mm-hmm. The Denver Broncos ended up being the team doing it, going Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler. But yep. I like this year we're considering it for corner because I, I don't think it's that crazy. It's about time that they do it. And I I think those picks are worthy because you got your guy on the defensive line. And could you make the argument that they would take an offensive tackle or a guard there? Absolutely. Could it's something that the Eagles have, but Hey, Howie Roseman, this is the year of the zig when everybody else zags So uh, on the Howie Roseman calendar. This would be the year of the zag as they would say. I agree. And this, uh, this draft is definitely doing that for us for sure. We'll continue Mock Draft Monday coming up next right here on the Lockdown Eagles podcast. What are we doing on day three? Stay tuned. Today's episode of the Lockdown Eagles podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing that we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule, for me, it's mock drafts, is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do, do more of it. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today. You're going to get 10% off your first month. Once again, that's BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn. 10% off your first month of online therapy. We thank BetterHelp for sponsoring the LockedOn Eagles podcast today. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for making LockedOn Eagles your first listen each and every day. It's Mock Draft Monday. Gino and I switching it up a little bit after a post Hassan Reddick Eagles world. The trade happened on Friday. So Gino went with an edge rusher at pick 22, but a versatile player that can play both inside and out. Darius Robinson from Missouri. Then, so this has been, I think, three players we've never taken a Mock Draft Monday before. At pick 50, I went with a boundary corner from Wake Forest, Kalen Carson. Then Gino double dipped at the cornerback position, going with Max Melton, the slot corner from Rutgers. 4-3 4-3 speed, maybe one of the best athletes in this class. Just And, you know, you mentioned, like, the, these three prospects, just dogs. Like, the personality, the tenacity, the, the toughness. Like, that's going to really add some juice to your defense. And it fits the mold of what Howie Roseman wants, man. Like, how many more times can you say Max Mullen is a great athlete, right? And yeah. Darius Robinson, I mean, whatever relative athletic score that you want to run him under interior defensive lineman edge rusher. I mean, he scores well in both of those regards and Kalen Carson falls right into that formula as well. And you're fitting need for now while also fitting future issues as well. 
and that's a true Howie Roseman draft. I don't think any of these picks were forced. I think all of these guys are worthy of those selections. That's why we made the picks, folks. We're not in the war room making the actual selections. We'll see come draft time. But, hey, this is something that the Eagles have needed to do, especially that double dip blue, especially adding young talent at the edge via the draft. Do it two years in a row. Why not? I agree. So we're back on the clock here at 120, the fourth round pick. Remember, the Eagles no longer have that third. They switch with the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Kenny Pickett trade. And I think, you know, in this scenario, if they go very defense heavy and edge rusher and then two corners, they likely go offensive line. But, you know, we're talking BPA. We're talking still the need for some weapons on this offense. Like you bring in Saquon Barkley, you get Paris Campbell and Devontae Parker to compete at that wide receiver three spot. One thing you still don't have, and we explored taking a tight end early in the draft on Mock Draft Monday last week. We went with Jatavion Sanders of Texas in the second round. I'm looking at Theo Johnson here that fell from Penn State, and I don't know if it's realistic that he'd be around this late in the draft because I think he's a top three or four prospect at his position, but Theo Johnson's somebody that I really like. He's got the size. He's got the body control. Really good hands would be the best number two tight end from a receiving standpoint you've had in years since you traded away Zach Ertz. I know they'd probably go tackle here, but I'm going to go with the heart pick. Theo Johnson completes your offense where you finally have a 12 personnel package that's respectable in the passing game. I think that would be a steal at 120. We teased the Penn State pick with Chop, and I'm sure... Uh, and we got to give our Nittany Lions fans. we got to pander a little bit. Yes, here. we have to. We have to get the people <laughs> in the state. we got to win the state, man. we got to keep those guys in-house. And Theo Johnson, it's... Not just a heart pick for those Penn State fans, but man, you talk about it, Lou. You talk about arguably Penn State U, maybe. I mean, one of the best outside of Iowa, one of the best universities at creating that position. And what can't he do for you, Lou? He's going to just outmatch guys that line up against him in the slot when it comes to the cornerback yeah. position. Oh, you want to put a linebacker on this guy? Well, his, he has arms as long as a tree trunk. The length is crazy. Yeah. It's insane length. And that run after the catch ability, Lou, now you got two guys in the middle of the field. Oh, add on Saquon Barkley now, too. Add on A.J. Brown. That middle of the field is going to be tough to tackle. A lot of mass, dude. Like, that's a lot of big dudes outside of Devontae in the pass game that you're going to have to worry about taking down. For sure. All right, Gino, you're at pick 161 here. We're finally going offense with a tight end off the board. You're going to keep that theme or maybe still go back to defense? Let's try and get ourselves an offensive lineman, a swing offensive tackle. Yeah. They love drafting this position. Jeff Stoutland, I just have to say one thing. I absolutely want this guy to have his own comedy show when he is done with his days in Philadelphia because the things he says are downright hilarious. But at the same time, he is one of the brightest minds in all of football. And he is going to look at three things, like I always say, length, size, and his ability to work with a player. And can he build that ball of clay? We picked this player a couple weeks ago. We haven't picked him in a while. Christian Jones, I think his size you can work with that type of player out of Texas, man. He played right yeah. tackle down at the senior bowl. He looked good. I think right away he comes in and he's going to be that guy that you could put in there. If Lane Johnson does go down, could mm -hmm. he potentially mold into that number one for you? I don't know about that, but is he a number one swing tackle for you from the get go? In my opinion, heck yeah. And Gino, the thing is like, sure. If you think Lane Johnson's going to retire this year, then Taking a tackle early is absolutely a priority, but if you think you're going to get multiple years still of number 65 on the right side, Jeff Stalin has proven year after year that he can develop literally guys that have never played the sport before into elite Dude, tackles. Put DJ Burns at right tackle, please, from North Carolina State. Like, I yeah, would love like to that's see what I'm saying. So for me, if you're just looking for a primary backup for a few years like you can get that guy on day two or day three like we've proven if anybody can do that in this league right now it's philadelphia so it depends on what you think about lane johnson's longevity right now when he decides to hang him up but i don't think like they have it's kind of like edge like could they go tackle at 22 or even trade up sure but in this scenario are people panicking i don't think they should be unless lane's gonna be gone this year no and in, in my opinion where you're wanting to pick 
an offensive lineman in this class is big V territory, right? Because at the time when they selected Halapuli, Vadi, Vitae, what did they have? They had Jason Peters, who was solidified. Right. They had Lane Johnson, who was solidified. But what didn't they have? They didn't have that guy that could play multiple positions for you and be the next guy up. They went out there and look at how Puli Vadi Vitae made a lot of money in the National Football League, and he still is because of what? Jeff Stoutland, his ability to play guys at multiple yeah. positions, and his ability to mold them. I'm with you, Lou. I, the more I think about it, like, yeah, is Troy Fautanu, it, would it be awesome to, to have a Washington of guy course. to come here and put on the Eagles green, and he's really, really good? Yes, but can you get those guys at the top of drafts that Jeff Stoutland can identify every single year? Unless this guy is like a true outlier, I'm confident you can find a replacement when that time comes. And Lane could play yeah. for three more years. He could play for six more years. Who, right. who really knows? And, and, you know, even if he retires this year, I think people just panic. They want a guy waiting in the wings for like three to four years just so they're ready. You can draft a guy next year. Like, I think people are just so scared to start rookie rookies on the offensive line, but look at Landon Dickerson. Look at Jordan Mahalata with very little experience when he play. had to play. Got to put him on the field. Look Tyler at Cam Jurgens. Yeah, in his second year playing a brand new position. Young guys got to play, and I know Eagles fans are so used to veterans that are elite playing for decades, and so you get scared of that unknown again. But you don't have to always be so proactive where you're taking them years in advance and wasting years of that very inexpensive rookie contract. So I don't mind mm -hmm. the strategy we're taking right now. We're back on the clock here at 171 and 172. This is the longest we've gone on Mock Draft Monday without going with a linebacker. I'm going to take one that I think some people would know from Ohio State, Tommy Eichenberg. When you talk about motor, just getting downhill, is this a perfect three-down linebacker, Gino? No. Is he a guy, though, that I think could play if you need him? If Devin White doesn't work out, if N'Kobe Dean gets hurt? Yes, I think this would be pretty good value for 171. Eichenberg played in a lot of big games, and I think he's a smart player. That's This is good value. And at this point, what are you looking at at the linebacker position at this point in the draft and this point in the season, right? Because you signed yeah. Devin White. You're anticipating that N'Kobe is going to come back. He is going to play a big role for you. I'm still under the presumption that Zach Cunningham will come back probably and be on this football probably. team. Yeah. You got to replace Sean Bradley. Yeah, you, you need special, find special teams teamers. Mm -hmm. Tommy Upberg, that's what he can do day one for you. Yeah. And he could potentially fill in and be a linebacker for you, like you said, because if Ben Van Sumeren is getting snaps, why can't Tommy Eichenberg? Exactly. All right, Gino, 172. Let's go to the safety position. I think it's okay. time that we, we started talking about safety on this show. Let's continue to talk about safety on this show. One guy that I am going to pick, and it is not for the bit. We're not going to take Evan Williams. It is Keaton <laughs> Oladipo, Oladipo out of Oregon State. He is another guy that you talk about kind of under the radar at the safety position. Is this a top-heavy safety class? No. But the middle rounds are really when you are going to see this one flourish. And you're going to see guys like Sione Vaki, I believe, continue to rise up boards. And heck, Jay Stanley from Southern Miss. I mean, these guys test well. They come out of the woodwork all the time. You just go and add one of those guys who... If Malik Mustafa was on the board, I'm taking him. I think he's yep. going to go way higher. I think safety, you're overdrafting if you take one on day two, and you're kind of underdrafting them if you take them on day three. But the NFL, we know how they take safeties. I think you're going to kind of luck into a, a pretty good player there in Keaton Oladapo there out of Oregon State. I hate that I'm taking a beaver and complimenting Washington. On I kind of love show. it. Daniel Jeremiah did tweet out today. Interesting that you were talking about the safety class. He said safety and running back are very similar where there's not some obvious day one pick, but you're going to see a run in rounds two through four where yep. it's very like middle of the pack heavy. And I think you're going to definitely see that at safety. 100%. I mean, you're going to have to add another one. I mean, Justin Evans isn't there anymore. And what do you have behind the big three that you currently have? Nobody. Yep. All right, our final pick here at 210. Deciding between a couple guys, we've taken this player once, I believe, and another one's been a, a big staple of Mock Draft Monday, Jaquan Jackson from Tulane at receiver. I'm going to go with running back Gino, though. I'm going to go with Isaac Arendo from Louisville. Power back, long-range speed. Like This guy can really get up to a 4-4, maybe even under that. Um, I, I think that'd be a good complement to what you got with Saquon Barkley and Kenneth Gainwell, a different style of back, and there's your, uh, there's your three-headed uh, committee in the backfield. Talks are that the Eagles are still looking at backs in this class, even after the Saquon yep. signing. 
I forgot who it was. It might have been Jeremy Fowler who had said that, but credit to whoever it was. But the Eagles always look on day three or in undrafted free agency. They're going to go and try and target that position because when they go into camp, they want five or six guys that can tote the rock. And even with Saquon, who's not going to touch the ball at all until the regular season starts, there's going to be right. a large opportunity to bring in some bodies into camp and see if you could potentially find the next Corey Clement for a season. And you bank on exactly. guys like Durando who are high quality athletes. And again, Saquon Barkley has an injury history too, Gino, and he's going to get a lot of touches in this offense. I don't want it to just be Kenneth Gainwell, and that's the only plan you've got in the backfield. And Boston Scott, like it always felt like when he was your third guy, your second guy really was your main plan because Scott could never be somebody that takes mm-hmm. on a big workload with that size. Whereas Garendo, I feel like if Saquon were to go down, he's somebody that's a, more of a candidate to really take on a big role. Yeah, he's just got to show it. He's just got to go out there and use that yeah. speed getting downhill, man. Like, just put the shoulder down and get those yards, and that's where he flourishes. Yep. All right, that's going to do it for Mock Draft Monday right here on the Lockdown Eagles podcast. Uh, a different one, but I really like it. Darius Robinson, the edge from Missouri at 22. Double dip at corner on day two. Kalen Carson from Wake Forest and Max Melton from Rutgers at 50 and 53. Penn State tight end Theo Johnson in round four. Then Gino went with tackle from Texas Christian Jones. Tommy Eichenberg, the linebacker from Ohio State. Uh, Keaton Oladapo, the safety from Oregon State. And then we wrap things up with Isaac Garendo, the running back from Louisville. We will be back tomorrow right here on Lockdown Eagles. Thanks so much for making us your first listen each and every day. For Gino Camilleri, I'm Lou DiBiase signing off. Thanks so much for downloading, watching, and listening. And let's go, birds. Fly, Eagles, fly.